Um, I'm pleased to welcome our next panel to the stage, and it's a great segue, I think, from the topics Keith was talking about, because our next panel is going to talk about actually designing a collaborative built environment. And I would like to welcome our moderator, Bill Saperito, first of all, who is assistant managing editor of Time Magazine, and Maurice Cox, past mayor of Charlottesville, Virginia, a small city that's well represented today, and a former director of design at the National Endowment for the Arts. We also have Julie Eisenberg, who's an architect with Koenig Eisenberg from the West Coast, Nicholas de Monchot, an architect, urbanist, writer, and assistant professor of architecture at the University of California at Berkeley, architecture and urban design. And our final panelist is Laura Solano, who's a principal with Michael von Valkenburg Associates, landscape architects. And I'm looking forward to hearing this discussion. Thanks, Bill. All right. Thank you. Thank you for hanging around to the four o'clock hour. We have uh, some great guests to uh, make it worth your while. The topic is designing a collaborative environment. And um, I'll just give you a, a personal example of that. I live in a cooperative apartment building in New York City, which means there are 80 people who share in that building. And getting 80 people to choose one paint color for the hall is a pretty interesting exercise in collaborative environment. It's mushroom, isn't it, or blue? <laughs> But downtown in Manhattan, there's a bigger problem, which has suffered from uh, a lack of a collaborative environment, which was the 9-11 the site, uh, which 10 years after the fact is still not completed. Now, a couple of our um, panelists I discovered before uh, have worked in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And uh, Julie, you did a uh, urban reuse project, correct? And Laura did a, uh, a riverfront park project. And uh, Maurice, you actually uh, participated in, in bidding on a project down there. I believe we're sending in a proposal. And I thought we'd start out by getting them to talk about their experiences in a city like Pittsburgh, which is it's an eastern city with, um, I would say, a midwestern sort of uh, atmosphere. Um, and it's. I think emblematic of, of some of the uh, problems we face today. So why don't you start? Well, uh, my firm in 1994 did um, Allegheny Riverfront Park, um, which is, was a brilliant idea. There really was very little um, residential development in downtown. And Carol Brown, who was head of the Pittsburgh Cultural Trust, had this idea that really is very old from the 19th century, which is to build the amenities to attract people. Um, to the site. Oh, I, we, we did a children's museum on the north side, which was considered the dicey part of town, um, which combined an old post office and a planetarium that stood vacant for 10 years. Uh, and uh, it's now the center of a kind of a children's district, because um, the director of the children's museum felt that uh, children brought back community presence of children. And uh, we won that competition through an NEA-sponsored national competition. And what's interesting about it probably is that it gave people in the town the license to think about things differently. So as we we're talking this morning so much about being user responsive, unless the set of expectations is big enough, your user responsiveness doesn't give you the best set of outcomes. So there's a balancing act there, and usually collaboration with community and uh, in the process requires an exchange of knowledge from both sides, not someone doing... Community process is not doing somebody's bidding. Community process is expanding the set of options by shared knowledge. One of the most difficult things about working in Pittsburgh at the time that we were working, which was the um, mid-'90s or so, um, is that there wasn't really a constituency for the park that we were building um, because there, there isn't a large population, residential population downtown. Um, it's one of those cities that, you know, bustles during the day, but nights and weekends, it's pretty, pretty calm. And that was a, that was a difficult um, lesson 
um, because you, you realize that you're actually designing for people and for their needs. But if you absent that, then you have to take your best shot at you know, making your way around the various um, entities that are going to uh, tell you how you can design that park. Um, I'd much rather have the interaction with people than I would with public agencies. Um, no insult to anybody here, of course. <laughs> You know, Laura, I was, I was thinking as well of the experience I've had with Pittsburgh. And Pittsburgh is a, a city of neighborhoods pretty aggressively because the topography is like really in your face. And a lot of the entrepreneurship, a lot of the community economic development is actually being done by cultural institutions, not by uh, the local government. So you have the Pittsburgh Children's Museum that is literally revitalizing an entire district um, taking on the responsibility not of only commissioning extraordinary work for young people, but also um, taking over the public realm and designing the public realm and programming the public realm. Or you'll have um, the Manchester Craft Guild, which some of you may know is this extraordinary facility that teaches um, uh, job retraining, but also teaches music and pottery and the arts to young people. Well, it's in one of the most troubled Pittsburgh neighborhoods, and the person who did it was a social entrepreneur. And so, I, at the same time, Pittsburgh is a city that's never done a comprehensive <coughs> plan. They, it's not legislated by the state to do a comprehensive plan. And the thing that's uh, inter interesting and contradictory about that is uh, a comprehensive planning process is one of the few opportunities that we have to officially convene the public to find out what their values are. And here you have a city that's never had to do it. So I found that there's a lot of grassroots action there, a lot of citizens taking action, and government is kind of not so much in the picture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great town on the verge of even better things. There's a great energy there. Mm -hmm. And it's because of these, yeah. these entrepreneurs. Well, and so many, so many parks and public spaces are developed in these public-private partnerships. That seems to be the way. Most of the parks that we work on, most of the public spaces are because there has been somebody that has foresight in the public, I'm sorry, in the private realm, and then joins forces with the public mm. uh, realm to to really get it done. Morris, you um, talked about developing um, an intelligent, intelligent citizens to go along with intelligent cities. And these intelligent citizens in Pittsburgh and places like that are the people who kind of force design and force change up. Now, you've been a politician as well as an architect. How do you get? the public involved, how do you develop an intelligent citizen who is going to take part in these projects? Hmm. Um, well, I might start by how do, you in, how do you develop an intelligent political class that is willing to take bold and often visionary and risky, um, uh, take on uh, risky projects? Uh, in order to do that, you need uh, an intelligent citizenry. You need people who are informed, who have the information, the latest information. They know what's happening nationally, so they can put their local intervention into a national perspective. And so, you know, I, I often talk about how do you have engagement in the, with the general public, but, but how do you have deep engagement? I mean, how do you transfer knowledge to people in a public venue where there's a, a broad cross-section of you know, educational levels and understanding of information? That's a public necessity in order to get to visionary work. And I don't think a city can do it without taking the time to educate um, their citizens. And you do that through charrettes. You do that through public workshops. You do that through public lecture series. You do that through door-to-door um, -door, um, participation in around tangible 
design opportunities that are happening in, in, in folks' communities. So it's the neighborhood parks, it's the riverfronts, it's the downtown core, it's where people live. And if you can tie, um, if you can tie the new learning to opportunities that are ripe and ready to happen, you can keep people engaged for a very long time, and guess what? They, in turn, can do, uh, take very, very bold and courageous decisions. So I'm of the mind that if you have the willingness to work with the public and you are willing to both transfer knowledge and receive knowledge from them, you can do transformative work in, in cities. Um, Nicholas, you've done some work, I know, on identifying small, unused spaces, and I think this ties into this idea of transferring knowledge of people don't know what they have in right. front of them. How do you get that information to them? What, what do they do with it in turn? Well, just to describe briefly the work that you're talking about, the, this is a project where now in both San Francisco and New York, we've identified um, uh, underutilized public land, small micro parcels, but when aggregated together, as we can do very easily using digital tools, turn out to be in San Francisco, two thirds the size of Golden Gate Park in New York, somewhat the size of Central Park and Prospect Park put together and have an enormous uh, uh, potential for, for social and, and ecological uh, contributions to the city at large. But, I would step back a little bit. I always have to be careful about stepping back because as, as an academic, it's my sort of proclivity to, <laughs> to do so. But, but um, I mean, the you work... You can't go past the 20th yeah. century, okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, um, try me. But the, the, um, but the, so that work, I think, is a really good... Uh, uh, the, the project is called Local Code, by the way, and there's, there's um, uh, a range of information available about it online. But the... the um, it's a good example of, a, I think, a fundamental point, which is, uh, I think, was, was beautifully illustrated by the, by the presentation that immediately preceded this panel, uh, which is to say that the, um, it is not, doesn't necessarily diminish the impact of technology to say that uh, it's always the, that the things which it amplifies and extends and engages are qualities that already exist. And uh, I was at the, an open system symposium organized um, by some of the same groups that are here today a few weeks ago, and our panel there was asked, who is, the, who is the Jane Jacobs of social media? And my response was that the Jane Jacobs of social media is Jane Jacobs, which is to say that she was amongst the first to isolate the kind of um, uh, which, uh, the, the, the massive interconnected layers of connections of which urban space is continually being negotiated and made in a kind of open source before the fact uh, versus a kind of singular design process. But I don't say that as a kind of, oh, we've seen this all before. In fact, it turns out, as I think Nick Grossman uh, uh, spoke to very nicely this morning, that in some particular instances, technology can have a transformative effect as it amplifies and, and taps into those existing networks. So we were able to, um, our work on leftover space was inspired by a project, a community-based project in New York in the 1970s with which the artist Gordon Meta Clark was involved, which took three years to find 15 you know, micro parcels on microfiche. Uh, and we can do that in five minutes with the GIS and ask a whole set of very different, much more critical questions. Um, Judith Rodin talked about uh, Facebook in Egypt, and, and I think we have to reflect that there were, there were uh, uh, political discussions happening in secret in Cairo for his 4,000 years, probably. But the, you went uh, way back. The, uh, but the point, but, but the ability uh, for a kind of anonymized, semi-anonymized interactions through Facebook, we're seeing it now uh, with the images coming out of Dara in Syria, the ability to, of the particularly transformative powers of technology aren't a kind of, uh, aren't a result of their novelty, but are actually precisely a result of their ability to amplify and tap into these existing forces which go into shaping the physical environments and also the political and social environment of cities. Well, we've now reached a point where people help companies design products. Yeah. Now, are we at the point where we want this to happen to a greater extent here, where we put plans out and then just wait for the public at every, large? To, every, to... every plan that I've seen done involves public review and a public process, and any plan worth its salt does that. Mm -hmm. Whether you can harness some of the uh, feedback technology of social media to enhance the reach and stuff, that's another issue. 
but public process has been around for a long time. It was a reaction to overdevelopment in the 70s. Sorry, I went back to the wrong century too. Um, where communities got really angry with development that they didn't think they could control. And ever since, they've been a thorn in the side of people who want to do things quickly and expediently. Right. And for, good, for better and for worse. Yeah. You know, Julia, I have to say that you are right that public engagement or public process is integral, it's legislated. You have public hearings. Uh, we all know there are public neighborhood meetings. Uh, that does not mean that it's done well. Exactly. And that, you know, to, to be asked to speak on a, a matter that's going to transform your neighborhood at a public hearing on a project that's been on its way for 18 months is really no participation at all. Uh, so what we're talking about is how do you build the capacity of people to get in on the ground floor to shape some of the values that are going to produce the redevelopment of cities as we know it. As and, the gentleman and that's said this morning, stuff. that was church, that was schools, right. that was door to door, that's that right. was in several languages, and it was in informal settings where people who aren't comfortable in the structured setting feel that they can be heard and have an opinion. Mm -hmm. So it's actually structuring a potluck that turns out to be an opportunity to talk about something that's happening. You start to gather information without actually even having to state that you're gathering it. Mm -hmm. you, and you can ask different questions that way. I think it's up to the design individual or, or firm to basically lead that process in a creative way that generates a lot of interest. In other words, when you leave a public meeting for a design, you ought to be really charged by the time you leave that. You ought to feel like you, you have been empowered to help whoever is doing this, um, help, them, help them make it over the line. And that's the problem. It, you know, we talk about greenwashing, but there's also sort of community um, but I have a feeling that some cities are washing. far ahead in yes. terms of yep. enabling that process and reaching deeper into communities. Uh, I think city of Santa Monica is pretty good at it. Right. So, um, Laura, how did that process work in designing, say, the Brooklyn Bridge Park? Um, that was a very interesting uh, process. Um, it was broken down into, there, were, there would always be groups that were much larger, you know, and, maybe. And let, me, let me interrupt, this is a, um, it's a reuse of land um, near the Brooklyn Bridge. The uh, city of New York is redeveloping its waterfront, which like many cities was industrial for its first hundred or so years. So we're de redeveloping um, six piers that were owned by the Port Authority, basically, and turning them into a public park. So that went anywhere from large public forum, where you know maybe 20 people asked questions and spoke, to uh, we set up a system whereby every week on Tuesday from X hour to X hour, you could come in and talk one-to-one -one with us. That meant that you, we gave you our full attention, um, we listened very carefully. There were always notes produced from that. And then there were open sessions um, on uh, Saturdays because we recognized that some people couldn't get there on a Tuesday afternoon. But probably one of the most interesting things we did is that we rented the bottom floor of our um, office building in Union Square and we set up a 30-foot long model of the park that people could literally walk around and ask questions about. So that was always manned and waiting for people to come in. They could drop in casually, anytime. I, I would uh, um, in, um, sort of speak to the, some of the sa same issues and this notion of open source in the, in the design world by um, talking briefly about uh, Google and architecture schools, which is to say, um, uh, you know, it's, it's the kind of standard joke on campus tours, and it's a very correct observation that an architecture school is almost guaranteed to be the ugliest building on any college campus. <laughs> and there's a very good reason for it. It's, it's that it tends to, an architecture building tends to be built with the client as the designer which is to say it tends to be built in a participation where the same person who has the, the role of representing and pushing the design process from the perspective of the user is also the person who is imposing a certain design vision. So you can look at buildings like Rudolph Hall, Hall at Yale, Worcester Hall in which I teach, as a direct result of that kind of process, and they don't work very well as, as public spaces. Google went, wanted to go, um, uh, I teach in the Bay Area, and 
and I've spoken to people at Google who were involved in the, the design of their Mountain View campus, in which they wanted to go in the other direction because as, a, as an open uh, uh, architecture company, they, they hired seven architects, asked them all to make different proposals, invited all of their users and, and uh, participants in the process to, to vote for different components of different designs with the notion that, as might be the case in software, a kind of wonderful composite space would happen out of this. And it was, I don't have to tell you that it was, it was an equally unmitigated design in terms of the in, in terms of the kind of dog's breakfast that resulted and therefore the <laughs> the, uh, the the but I, I wanted and I, I tie this back too to um, I think uh, Benji de la Pena, who I hope I'm not waking up to, <laughs> shockingly, uh, uh, when he, um, uh, I think, undersold the Rockefeller Foundation's contribution to Jane Jacobs' work uh, when he said that they gave her, it was actually $5,000 towards the, the, the death and life. But what they, what they gave her much more was the, the intellectual co contribution of Warren Weaver, who was the, the head of the foundation at the time, who was the first scientists to isolate something we take for granted now, which is what he called a problem of organized complexity, which is to say something is a balance of closed properties and open systems like a biological system, like uh, in fact it turns out cities have all the mathematical and, and statistical qualities of these problems of organized complexity too. And so the, I think we, we, we have to remember that the, the good design systems, whether, in, whether it's a design system in software or a design system purely in the physical landscape or what we're here to talk about today, which is the intersection of these systems, comes from this balance between structure and openness. You can think of the Manhattan grid as something that actually enables the spatial and social innovation of Manhattan versus restricts it. And so the, the uh, getting that kind of alchemy right of uh, nature, of course, does this very well over billions of years of evolution. But when we as designers are seeking to shape processes of placemaking, we are always seeking to, to balance a, a kind of a, a structuring of, of a process with, uh, with a kind of very open adaptive process that I think in, in all humility, we also need to understand that the best spaces work in ways that we never designed them to. And so the, the, it's a kind of, um, and I think uh, it's, a, it's a crucial point to remember as we talk about the, the intersections of all the, of the abstractions and simulations that come so easily out of technological tools and this kind of really uh, uh, evolutionary reality of the urban landscape that we can never quite impose a singular vision, but neither can we uh, uh, you know, just say, oh, uh, you know, an, an, a purely open process will automatically derive the b b results. You know, and that brings us back mm -hmm. to, I hope, finally, to Google and architecture schools. You, you really want neither, neither one is a particularly good way to make a public space. Good public space happens somewhere in the middle of that process of structure and openness. In other words, we really need architects. Is <laughs> well, I, I could, you know, I'm a little bit biased in that department, okay. but I, I think I can make a good argument. Yeah. But, Lauren, let me get back to you. What, what changes were made in, um, in the course of this kind of public um, viewing? Well, well, I think that um, people came with really solid ideas. They were interested in, um, acti wanted to make sure that we had the right activity level, things were going to be safe, um, there was going to be enough that was attractive to the entire cross-section of neighborhood that, that would be served by the park. Um, <clears throat> I should tell you that the people of Brooklyn Heights think this is their park, which is great, mm -hmm. because we did get that constituency that I was talking about uh, being missing. But, uh, you know, we, we changed, I mean, they had a physical effect on it. Right, Dim things, dimensional things were changed. Um, programmatic elements, um, mm -hmm. it's very heavy in recreation. I don't think it would have been that way if the neighborhood hadn't come to us and said, we have no place to pay, play basketball. We have kids that like tennis. I don't think that we would have come up with those things mm -hmm. on our own, maybe, maybe some of it but I think that they were instrumental in bringing that layer to the park. Yeah. You know, I was, I'm reminded of uh, Mayor, Mayor Williams, the former mayor of the district, uh, who said, um, the public is always right. Uh, they always know best. Um, they will always choose the right decision mm. once they've exhausted all possible alternatives. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> and that, in a way of saying that if we engage the public in the multiplicity of options that exist, they inevitably will choose those that are in their best interests and hopefully that have a constituency that's large enough to actually you know, merit uh, being primary in a design solution. I'll go, but I'll, I want to go a step further than that. I really believe in public input and public process. And, and like you have had plenty of, and, and you have had plenty of situations where someone in a meeting has stood up and said exactly the right thing <coughs> so that you could make a project in exactly the right way. And you just run with it and you say, that's fabulous. But the, you also have to have new ideas brought to the table. So we've got, <coughs> Uh, service providers. I think the not-for-profit world is going through a huge change. Social entrepreneurship from crowdsourcing to other strategies is rethinking the way it delivers, makes contact with the people it wants to serve. Community centers. I've got a client, CII, uh, Children's Institute. They generally deal with kids from violent situations. They do a lot of therapy work with families and kids. They came up with the idea that if they provided their service in a community center, then they could possibly reach more kids. So that meant they brought us a problem. I, we want a community center, and we want to help these kids. So now you've got an option of completely deinstitutionalizing uh, and destigmatizing the service, because this is just kids coming to a community center who happen to go off and meet with their therapist during the afternoon. Suddenly, you've done two wonderful things. And I'm finding that kind of imagination is happening across the board. I'm on the board of public architecture who are going about trying to collect 1% from architects to get a bigger reach into the not-for-profit world to take design because people actually believe and know now there's enough anecdotal evidence that design adds value. And it's not just about meeting functional goals. It's not just about... Um, meeting uh, about putting a roof over people who need it. It's about making an environment that pe makes people feel they're part of a community, that they're valued, that the place that they're in has value. And that's a wonderful place to be in. Combining that with this particular point in time, I'm staggered by what possibilities may happen in the next 10 years. I have no idea what they are, but I think it'll be fantastic. Well, we never... Um can see that technology until it sort of hits you. you, you just, we won't know what it does with it, but I know that it's all entwined. But one of the things that you've, you've had to do is sell difficult things, sell um, density, for instance. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. yeah. now in... Anyone got density problems in their town? <laughs> Everyone now, from New York can leave, but the rest <laughs> of us. Now, we all know that, that density is great. It's, it's, it makes for a greener city. It also makes you hate your neighbor, but that's another story. Um, <laughs> now it's getting personal. And it's getting personal. But how do you sell the toughest ideas? How do you bring, you know, mayor, how do you bring your constituents along? Designers, how do you... How tall a building can you build in Charlottesville? <laughs> well, um, when, I, when I first got on council, it was like three stories. It's now nine stories. Uh, and uh, we went through a public process of learning the value of proximity of one thing nearer to another thing. We don't use the D word. We talk about proximity. <laughs> um, and it was a, a public process. There was an enormous amount of new learning. There were dozens and dozens of public meetings over a two-year period. And uh, at the end of that process, we collectively agreed as a community to triple our urban density. And we did it very selectively in the places that you know, no one loved, all of those strip commercial streets that have a single suburban use. We said, sure, we'll have people living there and you know, um, retail on the ground floor. Uh, and now, uh, and we, but I think another important part of the policy equation <coughs> was not just um, imagining what these places might look like um, and visualizing them as designers can do, but also um, turning it back to the general public to now uh, change the rules of development that would make this kind of community that we have in our mind legal instead of illegal. Mm. 
Uh, and uh, I think that changing the rules and saying, you know, 150 dwelling units will happen here and this is what it looks like, 21 dwelling units here. It actually is not a nine-story building, it's a four-story building. That effort of really educating the public that this is what density looks like. It's exactly the kind of community that but you... But the hard part is them to understand that to have viable Jane Jacobs mm. mm -hmm. town, mm -hmm. right, you have to have enough people to sustain the stores. Absolutely. You have to make use of the infrastructure responsibly because you said you were for sustainability. You have to reduce the parking because then you'll get people using other modes. All of these things mm -hmm. are really difficult changes. I, the gentleman who talked about the fire turnings lane, I wanted, yes. to, I wanted to applaud him. I mean, this, it's exactly the issue of seeing things in isolation when you have to start to think about things collectively and, and get rid of old biases that are to do with, uh, I guess, siloed ideas of how you solve problems. You know, I, I wouldn't even call it biases because I think underneath it, and this was alluded to in the morning session, um, uh, connected very closely to density is the notion of mixed use, which is to say yeah. the right. the and uh, you know zoning is the great bugbear of of 20th century planning, and it came directly out of the technology of urban measurement that existed yeah. at the start of the century that mm -hmm. that sought to define certain sectors of the economy and imagine how they could contribute, and then a diagram of how those things related to each other became the embodied form of the city, with the notion that the diagram that could make things legible to the information technology of the time automatically led to the best urban outcome. Because they only had five colors, right? Right, right. And, and we're as much, but we're as much in danger of, I mean, we always think people in the past were dumber than us. I mean, just, uh, and technology tends to contribute to this, to this sense, but we are equally in danger, I would argue, of applying the same, um, uh, the, of, of instituting the, the, the we, we, we may come up with a more complicated, more multicolored um, uh, diagram of urban function, but we, we are still um, uh, always at risk of instantiating that diagram as the defined urban outcome with the ex expectation that the, the, as, as if we were dealing with an engine, the diagram of the function will produce the results. Uh, and so I think in, um, uh, I think especially also as a former resident of Charlottesville, the city suffers, you know, you could make an argument that the city suffers from a lack of density, but the city, a lot of these exurban places more profoundly suffer from a, from a lack of McHugh's. Los Angeles isn't yes. enormously dense, although it is actually denser than New York Would City think, taken yeah. as a whole, but, it, it's, it's, but, but the historic character of, of its best neighborhoods result in this kind of mixed use uh, and mixed program um, that defied kind of measurement in which people always tried to clean up in terms of producing these optimized technological diagrams, but which uh, in the end produced the robustness and resilience, which I think is the fundamental challenge of the next century in terms of urban design. Nicholas, I, I would go back to a, a comment you made about how do you visualize the opportunity that exists in many of our cities. Uh, in Charles, we had a similar challenge of uh, enormous number of scattered lots throughout the city, mm -hmm. most of them non-conforming. So uh, something was torn down, a suburban zoning ordinance came into being, and it made it basically illegal to build a house on that same lot. Or we had uh, a, a number of acreage, acreage that you would need in order to do compact mixed-use development. And it was three acres. So once we did an inventory of the parcels available within the city, we discovered that there were 6,000 parcels. Most of them were non-conforming. Most of them did not have three acres. Mm -hmm. And so the technology allowed us to visualize the opportunity. So the outcome of that was we changed the uh, acreage that you would need in order to do this in, uh, infill compact development. We released hundreds of units of smaller residential lots that were less than 6,000 square feet to the private sector to do infill housing on. But if we had not had the technology that allowed us to map this stuff and then market it to people who were able to do something about it, we would have never seized the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Laura, you're a um, landscape architect. How does this technology help you in interacting, if that's the word, with nature? I mean, this is um, sort of a, a different flavor. 
Well, I think that technology is sort of the, um, the end run of information. Mm. Um, landscapes are living systems. And oddly, I don't think that we as a community have grasped that. In other words, um, there has been a lot of uh, effort put into making cities greener, physically greener, but the, the methodology really has gone to waste because people didn't recognize that you have to have a landscape that is taken care of. In other words, the worst day of a landscape is the very first day it's open to the public because it's the most nascent. And nature just doesn't happen, at least the kind of nature that we all want to occupy. Um, you know, we're making cultivated landscapes. We're not recreating nature. People need to understand that. We are not recreating nature. We are setting up the systems by which that can occur. But even when we set that up properly, there has to be maintenance. Um, you know, somebody loves a public open space to death. There has to be some response to that along the way so that it doesn't happen. So, you know, we're, you know by learning how systems work, by learning how uh, drainage systems work and how we can improve them and return water back for recycling or just return it to the ground, you know, we've developed technologies that help us recognize that. But the, the base idea is rooted in science, really, you know, that, that's, that there are biological reactions taking place. And if you don't make the, the place for that, they're not going to happen, no matter what you do, no matter how much technology you introduce. So technology is just the means. I, you have to have the bigger idea. This issue now. of maintenance and service is a huge idea that's finally being understood. Again, 20th century planning and why we had urban renewal projects that the, uh, that provided affordable housing that didn't work wasn't because the architecture was was blocks, it was because there was no service. There was no management and there was no maintenance. Um, and that's a, that's a, a huge component that doesn't get discussed. Mm -hmm. The hardest thing to get through in a city budget is maintenance. The maintenance budget gets cut first. Everybody wants to do the sexy capital programs under their watch. And it's probably one of the things that we, that you're, you know, you're talking about in the landscape thing, it, it's in landscape, it's in schools, it's in housing. The improvement in affordable housing, this is an interesting story just to bring it home. The Las Vegas police force did a study of how much it costs to keep, sort of deal with homeless people living on the street. Um, my numbers are never accurate, so <laughs> do check this. But it was something like 60,000 a year by the time they'd gone through emergency care. Mm. If you provide um, supportive housing that has services on the premises, the cost of housing that person, now you've also, you've already got them off the street, right. is $40,000 mm -hmm. a year. So the issue of having a system that has support in the long term is really a fundamental concept of sustainability and intelligent design. Well, let's segue from that into the the latest um, rage, which is the, which is our lead certified buildings, and uh, yeah. mm. uh, we'll <laughs> hot spot. Um, where are we in this process? Is it phony? Is it how real are communities in enforcing it? Um, is it going to work? Lead is great as far as it goes, but lead is a basically for those who aren't familiar with it is a basically a numerical system for quantifying the extent to which <clears> you minimize the negative impact of your design. And we need to completely flip out of that mindset into uh, an environment in which all components of the public landscape are, uh, uh, have an expectation of a contribution to the public sphere in ecological material terms. So lead is great as far as it goes, but it tends to, to mm -hmm. make one think of, oh, you know, heck, this is just going to be bad and we have to do it as, as, as unbad as possible. Whereas cities are made out of these positive contributions. The other, the, the issue that I wanted to raise, which was raised again by Judith Roden this morning, which I, I think is, is fundamental and essential, that, that a, many models of sustainability um, are, are, are models of sustainability towards a specific outcome or a specific scenario. 
Whereas, in fact, the great challenge we face as designers in the next decade, and one with which we uh, can, can instrumentalize, best instrumentalize, I, I would argue, the capacity of urban technology is not towards any specific scenario, because if we really look at the, the, the prospects for cities in the 21st century, it involves a degree of uncertainty surrounding climate change, surrounding the advent of peak oil, takes 762 gallons of gasoline per person per year to make Atlanta work. We have no idea how that will you know, uh, uh, evolve in the next five to 10 years. When, uh, uh, and so the, the, the notion that we can, one of the thing, things technology does, which is always dangerous for designers and probably for everybody, is it, it, it's, there's a tendency of a mathematical process, which is what is underlying computation, to seek a single optimum and to create a single simulation, which, which everyone you know, passes around and mistakes for mastery of, uh, of, of the real situation. But sophisticated algorithms give you multiple outcomes, so there's no reason to be thinking it's that true. way. It's true, it's true, that, and, and that's what we need to, that, that's what I would argue we need to do, but the, I would say that the kind of, the, things aren't necessarily spring-loaded in that direction, but it's that fundamental property of resilience and robustness to a level of change that we, by, by the very definition, can't, adequately imagine or, or set out. That, that is the, the fundamental issue that we need to be thinking about. And so I, 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 I know this isn't a direct answer to, to lead, but you know, trying to so precisely quantify our negative impacts is to me, to a certain extent, missing the point of sustainability. Sustainability implies a kind of continuity, which right. is precisely the reverse of what we're likely to, to, to meet. Which gets back to something I said earlier in, in the day. I was a person who asked the question about what the implications were on city staff. We need, we have some great smart people in lots of cities, but we need more smart people, I think, in mm -hmm. cities to be able to ride the wave of opportunity and build the robustness into the system, understand what needs to be thought about. Planning is, is back, I think, at the city level, rather than on the individual developer level, um, because it's... Well, we don't actually do much planning <laughs> on the city level, let's face it. Yeah. I mean, what we do is permitting um, of property, single parcel property development. There's very, very few American cities have a robust planning uh, outfit. Uh, DC may have one, Chicago, New York, San Francisco, but you go to the average American city of 500,000, and you won't find mm -hmm. a planning staff. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you, he, we both, well, you know it more than I do from the Mayor's Institute on City Design, you can tell uh, which ones do and which oh, ones don't. Oh, you absolutely can. But you know, I didn't want to uh, uh, sidestep the lead because there's so many Sorry. things that we, um, we probably could dismantle it. The part that gets me is you know, what we don't measure in lead. And I would argue that you know, we measure what we value in society. And the component that has always got me is we don't try to um, measure uh, the social um, robustness of an organization or a public space. There's a point so it's for that. the social, the economic, point. the environmental, <laughs> and the design. Point. That you design is not a criteria. I mean, physical beauty mm -hmm. is not a criteria. But I think, it, and I'm, you know, I'm talking about a, a a network that I and others founded called the Seed Network, uh, purposefully upon on lead. Um, that talks about the social, environmental, economic, design components and how we begin to measure that. And we created uh, an, a, um, an evaluator so that people can start to talk about the social uh, impacts of design, not just their environmental impacts. And I think that, again, if we believe that design has a social impact on people's lives, then we had better start measuring it, finding additional ways to measure that, and uh, as well as its environmental. So. Let me um, follow up with the reporter's question. Give me an example of that. Of, uh, of a of project measuring that, social. Well, I mean, y y there are uh, projects, for example, there is a, a day center for the homeless that was developed in New Orleans. <laughs> Uh, this is a place that um, is in downtown New Orleans and a place for the homeless to be able to go during the day to get meals and social services. Um, we can measure whether that has had an 
impact on their well-being um, as, as citizens of that community. Um, or you can measure whether we've had deep engagement in a public process or whether we've just kind of gone along the surface. Uh, and sometimes that involves, you know, how did the values of that community get conveyed through the project in its end result? So I think you can measure social indicators of social well-being in the built environment, in the natural environment. Well, you know, whatever you think of LEAD, it did open up a lot of doors yeah. to our... It's our friend. You know, to our, right, it is our friend, sometimes. Um, <laughs> that's a what very friends expensive are, that's friend. What friends are, that's what friends are like, right? <laughs> it, it allows people to change their minds. That's the biggest help that LEAD's been in any community setting for me, is that you can think about things a different way because we're trying to take a sustainable approach and there'll be a, a measurement of that that LEAD provides and it allows people to think about things differently. I was involved in the um, Sustainable Sites Initiative, which is basically the equivalent for landscapes of getting LEED certification. Yep. Um, you know, why we haven't had it until now is beyond me, but, um, you know, landscape sustainability. Um, and I must tell you, it is very difficult to be on that side of the table and keep all of those things that we've been talking about in your mind. Yeah. Because yeah. you, you know, by nature of the system, you have to assign points and values. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it is so limiting. And so I think that if you look to LEAD or the Sustainable Sites Initiative to be the measure of whether or not something is sustainable, you're measuring, you know, one or two dimensions. That's yeah. it. Yeah. And so there has to be ancillary ways that we can convey those things because in the end, the social is the most important, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it is what makes spaces work or not work. And so if we're not measuring that, then we end up with City Hall Plaza, can, right? Exactly, uh, exactly. Can technology help you measure that or is this too soft? Well, to... LEAD is a great example of how, how a kind of quanta for the tendency of LEAD, and LEAD is done with databases and with a kind of spreadsheet driven, um, uh, uh, methodology in which, uh, and it's a great example of how a kind of quantified process can, can kind of simulate or give you the outlines of an idea like sustainability, but, can, but cannot substitute for a kind of robust mm -hmm. enga engagement with the reality of sustainability. Lead has been a very useful a kind of prosthesis to help develop that conversation within the design disciplines, but it is precisely not a real conversation about issues of sustainability. Mm -hmm. there, mm -hmm. there are all kinds of, if you especially look at the issue of social measurement, there's mm -hmm. all kinds of um, uh, kind of uh, uh, case studies of, of something like the Community Analysis Bureau in Los Angeles, which from the mid 1960s into the 80s attempted to quantify and measure issues like social benefit, but it was, uh, uh, they had kind of uh, 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 something like a, a racial uh, contentment index. I mean, all these kinds of scary things, people coming out of RAND and attempting to to, to, to implement, uh, uh, again, using mainframes and, and uh, a kind of technology-driven process to, to measure, evaluate, and, and target resources for, for kind of social innovation in Los Angeles. And the, the, the problem that that process had is that they, as is so often the case, mistook the measurement for the reality. Mm -hmm. They mistook the, mm -hmm. the fact of, of having been able to somehow come up with a number which could con quantify this ineffable concept, which is the, the kind of uh, uh, urban contentment of various, you know, it, it, the, 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 uh, I, I'm not saying that an attempt, uh, as in Maurice's, I think, very good work to measure or evaluate something like social impact is not actually a really good thing, but it, it comes, it brings with it a host of problems, which we, uh, which we need to understand as part of the package in terms of the, the tendency of technology to reduce things to singular variables, mm -hmm. even uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, even laudably so. But a lot of this is my, my problem is I'm not a measurer. <laughs> I'm an instinctive designer who okay. thinks a lot of this is common sense. When the gentleman just presented the stuff on how people use social spaces and gave us all the numbers about the interactions and, and the the uh, uh, device users and all that kind of stuff. It's great for me because I can go with a more persuasive argument about something we already, I already understood. 
So that part is wonderful. But we need to approach this as empathetic human beings. Right. You design housing as if you're coming home for it, to it. Doesn't matter if it's yours or somebody else's, a rich client or a poor client. It's the same deal. Well, you know, I mean, I, I think the challenge with information, because what we're talking about is getting good information and sharing it broadly in a way that it allows people to transform their thinking on matters. You know, uh, I know a lot of politicians that, that um, lack good information. Mm -hmm. And then I know a lot of other politicians that when they're given good information, they do nothing with it because mm -hmm. it contradicts the outcome that they were anticipating. So we have to figure out a smart way to use information that empowers and enables people um, not to sidestep uh, the outcome. You know, the facts, you don't get to decide what the facts are, right? The facts are the facts. And, uh, are they? Well, you know, uh, there, are, there, are, there are a lot of, a lot of political uh, entities that you know, make up their own facts, and then we have to deal with the consequences. But I, I, just, I think this issue about getting good information, sharing it in a way which is accessible to people that allows them to, to make courageous decisions. And I've seen it happen. I've seen people completely, you know, their interests uh, be transformed by good information. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can assure you that most of our political leaders who have to make decisions that are affecting our built and natural environment do not have the information they need to create better communities. I, I think one of the, uh, the, the interesting things in our contemporary culture is that information design has become, through the work of Edward Tufte and others, a kind of lauded, important part of public discourse. And I think that's very much important. And I, I think the, the work, for instance, that, that, uh, that the, the Building Museum and Time has done in producing information graphics is, is deeply essential. Uh, I think w with that, as a kind of Surgeon General's warning, I think part of the problem of, of those, all those beautiful Tufty books, for instance, is the, the implication somehow uh, that the information itself will have they a kind of power answer. and authority yeah. uh, yeah. to, to enact change. And I think the, the kind of the sequel that I'd love to f have in that beautiful beige series is how do you create the process whereby the kind of elegant d uh, distillation of, of facts will have a kind of leverage on political and social process. Absolutely. And that's, the, the, that's not necessarily the responsibility of a graphic designer, and yet it is an essential corollary to the, the presentation and assembly of visual data uh, as, a, as a field. Well, I think one of the problems is that all that stuff gets mixed up into a legislative process, and yeah. mm -hmm. all bets are off. And did we want to take some Twitter uh, questions? Is that? Now tell me, why do we take Twitter questions before we take local questions? I'm just the moderator. <laughs> I don't make the rules. Are the Twitter people in the room, are they just shy, or is it from online from somewhere else? We don't even know. That could I be don't even know. I'm per perfectly happy to take questions from the No, I, I, from I'm just curious because I've been wondering that all, uh, um, all day. <laughs> I don't see any, any We've got tweets up there. there. So. I frightened oh, the tweet true. people. Oh, that's true. We have the screen here to see the tweets. Can we turn the mics on, please? Mics on? Oh, there you go. Um, the discussion of information and how we've used that to, in a flat spreadsheet to decide whether this is a lead platinum building or not, and how, or further back in history making um, highway throughput decisions based on, well, where are the weakest communities, yeah. assumes kind of this level of information uh, density that um, is very, very different from what we're getting now. Yeah. There was Malte Spitz, a politician in Germany, this, just this March, decided to ask, ask Deutsche Telekom, his cell phone provider, to give him as much location data as they could about him over a six-month period. And they had 35,000 data points over a six-month period. Multiply that by the total number of cell phone users in Germany or in the world, which are all gathering location data. Yeah. And this is the kind of data set that you're going to get about how people are moving in space. Um, and this is partly a comment, partly a question. That there's also research that shows that your movement within a city is as unique as your fingerprint. Because you only go from your house to your office. Nobody else has that pattern unless someone in your house works in, in exactly the same office. Mm -hmm. So given that kind of level of data that we are going to get, can you address that in terms of 
this much data, how are we going to build collaborative environments around it? And how are we going to absorb all of that to understand it for design but isn't, issues? Isn't that a design question in and of itself? Yes, it is. Because if you're designing, I mean, the, the general consensus is you, you, can, you can take stuff in, but you want to have a set of possibilities of arranging these things that's a manageable amount of information to be able to, to make evaluation from, right? I mean, that's a, a reasonable proposition. So it's an easy one to say, well, the kids at UC San Diego, do you know when the biggest bandwidth use is? Two o'clock in the morning. That's real information. <laughs> but cell phones dotted all over everything and everywhere doesn't tell you anything, which is what you're struggling with. So it's about the people who are designing the way we look at the information we're getting that have a huge responsibility well, in my mind. Two, two sides. The second part of the question was related to what, what, uh, what Maurice just said, is that yeah. information that our, our decision makers as, as is already don't have enough information to decide. The flip side of it is when they get this, this tsunami of information yeah. and you need the designers to figure out how to present it. We know that designing is editing in yeah. many ways. Right? Well, and everything so is. Come on. Yeah. I mean, Benji, I would, my response to, to that would be this, the, the, the Eric Schmidt quote that was discussed this morning about, you know, we only had 500 gigabytes of information until 2003, and then I, I would, there's an important qualification to that, which is to say, until 2003, we only had 500 gigabytes of information susceptible to rendering as data points, as, and uh, in fact, the, uh, uh, one can look at moments like the, the vast increase of, in printed production in the, in the 19th century, and, and actually find analogous moments when we had to cope with more of a new kind of information, and more of a different kind of information. I would even argue that, that the, the, the kind of pure, you know, you get a huge reduction in bandwidth and subtlety with data points, but it is actually, I would argue, even much more transformative than that huge increase in, in, um, uh, in, uh, uh, in say, printed information. And so what we need to do, again, is not so much invent new ways of doing, doing business, but identify the... Um, the moments where we can find a good alignment between the, um, the, 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 the massive quantities of data and the processes that create and interpret those data and maybe uh, give up some control. Don't, the, the, a kind of a very conventional way would say, oh, it's my responsibility to produce the or infographic that will like perfectly you know, an, uh, 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 illustrate that and instead say, well, given that this information is already in such a, such a kind of impoverished quality, one of the great, the, the only richness to digital information is, the, is its is the, is the zero cost of moving it around. And so instead, I can outsource the process of interpreting the data to a whole set of collaborators you know, very easily. And so it, it's those kinds of shifts in thinking about the structure of processes, which are, <coughs> excuse me, I know that must be especially painful for all of you, but the, the, um, uh, it's those shifts in the, in the structuring of process. And that's, the, uh, I've heard a lot today about the urban, but I haven't necessarily heard about urbanity, which is this process of exchange and debate and continual kind of collective agreement, which I, I think the, uh, uh, we, are, we are already good at, but we aren't necessarily good at in the realm of of digital information, and that's, I think, one of the great, um, one of the things I'm optimistic about, about discussions like this, is developing potential frameworks to bring that level of urbanity to it. I, 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 it's, okay. th you know, that minister is already yeah. dealing with a huge amount of information. You know, Nicholas, so, I mean, I would, did this issue about data and how to use it, because, I mean, I'm not a, a data junkie, but if you're in political office, you get tons and tons of data, mm -hmm. and I can tell you, that um, that had never that never trumped my intuition mm -hmm. about what it is my community valued and whether the data that was being collected matched their values and that's when you can make a decision but you know data for data's sake you know who cares if you if you don't know what your community values and i would argue that each community is really quite unique and distinct so you have to find some way to collectively uh, always uh, understand what they want, and then you can take that information and say, you know, this, has, this doesn't actually reinforce our values. It's called leadership, I think. Even, <laughs> even if you hang your hat on data, mm -hmm. a 
a good researcher checks the sources, right? <laughs> they go out and check the data. Right. Was, right. It, the was there right. an, right. an anomaly, you know, in that particular day? Right. Which is so, the public you're right. talking so about. Right. So uh, having data doesn't erase the need for Human interaction. interaction. Right. Okay. So we'll go in the back and then come up front. I have heard the panel say we needed open source. Could, could you just speak a little closer to the mic? I will. Thank you. I have heard the panel say we need open sourced architecture for public spaces, etc., which involves bringing the public in uh, at the beginning. And you've also said that if you just let the public decide the design, you get a dog's breakfast. Uh, what, which did, therefore, what, did, what did we say? Uh, can you run that by us again? I I don't... One, of, one of you said that if uh, the uh, input from the public is not mediated by a designer, it becomes a dog's breakfast. Uh, by, by some structure. By structure. Some structures. Well, yeah. I would imply that yeah. to design generally. There there's yeah. generally seems to be superior design needs the intervention of a of a design thematic, something that does not often come from the public just coming in and splashing a lot of different opinions. There seems to be some need to organize it uh, to produce an architectural uh, result. Um, at least let me posit that as an assumption for going forward. Uh, the, the, where I'm going with this question is your sense of the a level of education of architects or designers or form givers who will have the patience and fortitude to be facilitators of this messy public process and yet still have the skill and uh, uh, ability to, to shape that to the level that, uh, that it needs uh, a chef. Okay. Uh, and uh, do we need to do something about architectural training or urban design training around the country in order to satisfy the need for that kind of a public servant who can help be a midwife to this holistic human okay. process. All right, so let me cut you off. So the question is, do we need to re-educate architects? It's, all right. it's already happening. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. And I think mm -hmm. we need to be a little more inclusive than uh, talking about architects, because I like to refer to us as designers. So we're talking about urban planners, we're talking about urban designers, we're talking about landscape architects, we're talking about uh, you know, real estate developers. Yes, we're talking about architects. Uh, I think we're talking about the, the community of people who um, can interpret uh, the built and natural environment. Okay, I'll, I'll take one more here. Elizabeth Merritt. Can we get the mic, please? Hello, Elizabeth Merritt from the Center for the Future of Museums at the American Association of Museums. Nicholas, thank you very much for bringing up earlier the example of how peak oil is going to have a huge impact on the city of Atlanta. I can I realize you speak that. up a little, please? Sorry. Sure. I'll speak closer to the mic. Nicholas was talking about the example of how Atlanta was in the long term probably unsustainable because of the energy costs when you take into account the fact that we're approaching peak oil. And you talked about the need to identify areas for, of uncertainty when we're doing this planning. So much of what I've heard today talks about meeting today's needs. But we've also talked during the day about the effects that decisions a century ago, whether it was the street grid established by the streetcars, whether it was Robert Moses mucking things up later, we're going to have 50 or 100 years later. Can I just ask each of the panelists to very quickly identify what uh, you think is most likely to disrupt our orderly progress to the expected future, whether it's a trend or a disruptive event if you were talking to a city planner today, what would you say, pay attention to that, because that could change the game? We need to recast the notion of climate change as climate uncertainty. It's a, it's a massive, uh, uh, we, we don't actually know what will happen. This is part of the, of the uh, uh, and it will have vast consequences for the built landscape. I think we need to uh, protect our investments. In other words, there are so scarce dollars these days that are put into uh, the development of, of designs that uh, it's, it becomes a waste of money if you don't uh, protect that investment by continuing to find funds to maintain it. Okay, that's all we have time for. I want to thank our terrific panel. They were really great, so please give them a round thank of applause. You. Thanks for having us. And I...
And I do want to mention that, that Nicholas has a book out called Space Spacesuit Fashioning Apollo and Architectural History of the Apollo Space Suit, which it's cool. is a little <laughs> offbeat, but I'm sure it'll be just as interesting as he is. So again, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Great. I'd like to thank again the panel for today, one of our last panels. And before we break, before um, the, um, we break for our last panel of the day, um, the, I would like, um, when we're done uh, with this panel, we are going to invite everybody to a reception afterwards. It'll be just upstairs in our pension commissioner suite. Um, with that, though, we've been talking about um, the, from experts from around the country on these critical issues of the day, and um, we thought we wanted to end with those decision makers, those um, that wrestle with these practical decisions from a municipal standpoint. Um, and so we're going to end with a town hall session where uh, the, um, we'll have a moderated discussion, um, the, and then we're also going to incorporate some of the amazing ideas that we've heard throughout the day and throughout uh, lunchtime from you all. So with that, um, the, let me introduce um, very quickly our three panelists and moderators. They get set up with their mics. Um, we have Martin Chavez, who is the past mayor of Albuquerque, New Mexico, and who is also the executive director of ICLE Local Governments for Sustainability USA. I should also mention that Marty has been an advisor to the Intelligent Cities Project. Uh, we have William Millar, who is the president of the American Public Transportation Association. We have Mitchell Silver, who is the president of the American Planning Association and the director of planning at, of Raleigh, North Carolina. And our moderator today will be Michael Duffy, the Washington Bureau Chief for Time. Please, them, please give them a warm round of applause. I'm welcome. Well, as soon as everyone's mic'd up, we'll start. I'm Michael Duffy from Time Magazine. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for the introduction, Scott. Um, our job today is to talk about how to build an intelligent city. And luckily, I have three of the greatest uh, intelligent builders right here. Um, but since we're talking as much about cities that are already built, we're talking also about how to rebuild them, or maybe the better word is renovate them into intelligent cities. Um, and with that, thank you, gentlemen, for all joining us today. I'm going to just start and go this way. Um, Marty, you were mayor of Albuquerque three times. Uh, if you had to pick uh, what an, the most important building block is or would be, and taking uh, a typical or average American city as we know it or that we might live in now and turning it into what would be a more perfect place to be, what, what would be maybe the top one or two? As we say, a more perfecter, more perfecter. Uh, community. Uh, you know, one size doesn't fit all when you're talking about uh, local communities. And so mayors on the uh, west side of Mississippi, if you will, have a different challenge than those on the east side. If your city was built in an era and premised in an era of, of cheap gas, cheap land, uh, infinite resource, water, et cetera, then the natural thing to do is what Western cities did, and that's sprawl. Uh, whereas cities here on the East, east Coast uh, were built before the automobile. So a different challenge. Uh, and, and of course, the biggest challenge for policymakers is once you know what the reality is, what do you change uh, for what you do? So for Albuquerque, uh, like many of the Western cities, we're uh, confronted with a, a sprawled out community. Uh, density, obviously an imperative uh, for a whole host of reasons which have been discussed uh, throughout the day. Uh, you have a community that is in one mindset, leadership that's perhaps in a little bit different mindset, and so the challenge is to bring the two together. Uh, and you do that around the public processes, you do that around the infrastructure uh, and uh, through the planning process. So consensus, an important building block. Consensus to the extent possible. Uh, Albuquerque is 528,000 people with about 1 billion opinions. <laughs> Bill, do you have a different building block that you would pick out if you had to pick out one or two? Or well, I, I certainly would agree with that building block, but I would pick out the block of using the information that we already have and that we already collect and use it in a way to make the city more intelligent, more efficient. Uh, just as the mayor used the Mississippi River to divide east from west in different ways of looking at cities, what we're finding in the public transit field is the people west are discovering that those people east actually did have some good ideas. And so we've seen the, light, the rise of 
light rail investment and bus rapid transit investment and other forms of public transportation that frankly many of the western cities never thought uh, that they would need. So using the data, using the experience, looking around, pulling it together and then making a new set of decisions seems to be very popular around the country right now. Okay, Mitchell, your turn. I would say first and foremost is a city that understands its purpose. Uh, very often people think cities are there for just being there, but cities have a purpose. They have an economy, <clears throat> they have to provide jobs, they have to provide recreation, mobility, access, not just to the city but to the region. So I first start with the purpose, that the public understands the purpose, the elected officials understand the purpose, and then all the systems start to fit in place. So that is very often we start a long-range discussion or exercise is the first to understand what your purpose is, and it varies from place to place and region to region. So if I had that ideal notion, my first conversation is for that city to understand what its purpose is. So again, consensus. Yes. In some ways. Now, as the city planner for Raleigh, go Wolfpack. Um, well, <laughs> yes, go Wolfpack. I'm from, the, I'm from the Northeast, so, you know. I'll adopt the wolf pack. Okay, fair enough. Um, if they would win, I'm sorry, I didn't say that. <laughs> Clearly, we don't have consensus yet in Raleigh. Um, uh, even in Raleigh. Talk to us a little bit about where you said w w where the city needs to go or what, kind of, what its goal as a city is. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you think in those terms about Raleigh for a yes. minute? Well, uh, we started our comprehensive planning process uh, back in 2006. And that was the first question, is that where do we want to grow? Uh, where we want to be by 2030? Uh, we had some of the bad examples. Unfortunately, I don't know if you're from Atlanta, but we said, okay, we don't want to be that. But we wanted to start figuring out what would Raleigh be when it grew up. It's kind of at that point of adolescence where it was a city coming of age. And we wanted to learn from other cities. And so we had a conversation about what is a 21st century city. We did that two years before we even started the planning process about our blueprint for growth. We did an assessment of how much land we had left. We found out we had about 20,000 acres, and we knew we could not sustain ourselves on building low density. We had to find a new approach. So we went through that exercise about how were we going to grow? How are we going to deal with an aging population? How are we going to deal with uh, a sprawling community? We're known as sprawly, which most people Probably. may or may not know. <laughs> uh, and we realized that the pattern we used in the 1980s and 90s uh, was not going to work for the 21st century. And so we laid out this information to the public, a very intelligent population, and they decided to take a new way forward. And as a result, we now have about eight growth centers that will accommodate about 70% of all of our new growth. We expect to grow by roughly 250,000 over the next 20 years on this 20,000 acres. Low density wasn't going to work any longer it would be too difficult to sustain it in terms of a road network, and so we decided to take a new path forward. So we have this blueprint that 96% of the public supported, and as a result, we had unanimous approval by the elected officials. One more question, did you get the growth center idea from someplace else, or did that come in integrally? Well, there are other places, either your, your hub and spoke, uh, like Charlotte, for example, we decided to go polycentric. It had a lot of advantages, it's more transit ready, and so uh, since the triangle basically is built on a polycentric notion, we decided to use polycentric throughout our city. And so it is basically a centers and nodes plan, except we have multiple centers. And so that's done in many other places across the country. And do you call them growth centers? That the yes, word we call it growth centers. Marty, it sounds like one of the important ingredients in an intelligent city isn't just consensus, but also learning from others. Well, uh, cities, mayors are incredibly competitive. Uh, and the best ideas are very often the ones you swipe from a, a neighboring community or one uh, even around the globe. And so uh, what you have is this, in, in the context of this competition, is, is a design, hopefully by design, cities don't grow entirely by design, uh, about how are you going to attract the best and the brightest, if you will. Uh, you compete for employers, you, can, you compete for employees because increasingly, as we know from Richard Florida, that, that's an important way to attract the jobs if you have the quality of life. Uh, and so then you just build on the assets. Uh, and not every community has the same assets. If you're Mike Nutter in Philadelphia and you're rehabbing the downtown and you're trying to attract young people to your downtown core, 
well, what if 20-somethings really want to have mountains? Right. Can't do much about that if you're in Philadelphia. So you say, well, what things would attract that class of individual to my community? Build on that. Gotcha. So borrowing's totally OK. Uh, Bill, you've worked in transportation, particularly in Pennsylvania, uh, all your life. Is there a, a, a transport uh, concept or idea that you found yourself seeing elsewhere that you uh, went and uh, swiped? <laughs> I was going to say borrowed. No, nah, borrowed, swipe, whatever. The public paid for it. Let's use it everywhere if it's it works. Common I mean, use. Uh, you know, on that. Yeah, I think the concept that I uh, that I finally see people having is a light goes on and people suddenly understand land use and transportation and together, and you simply can't deal with them separately. So if you only got twenty thousand, what you say, acres, acres to deal with uh, in a already developed community. Uh, you have to make sure that the plans for those 20,000 acres can be supported. Uh, and so I see more and more around the country discussion around that. I see lots of uh, communities trying to build that consensus, whether it's through, through some kind of uh, charrette process or other public type process, to get people to stop and think, what is the kind of community that I want? There are certainly some communities that are well known for this. I'm sure today sometime the phrase Portland, Oregon got mentioned, or uh, Salt Lake City, Utah might not be one on somebody's web, uh, 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 what do I want? Uh, right uh, screen. Yeah, looking right at it. And yet, they're doing great, great work in that community. Uh, it started with a community process of beginning to ask what kind of community you want. So I think the melding of those two things, stealing that idea that you can't do it in a vacuum, is one thing, one really positive development I see happening across the country. You also talked, Bill, in your, in your first list of when I asked about building blocks, about the use of data in particular, yeah. and, and how municipalities uh, use it, uh, learn from it, um, and I, I'm guessing go back and get more sure. of it. Can, can you talk for a minute about um, what you've seen in that area that you think is particularly useful yeah. um, and, and how it has, has been profitable? Well, I think there's uh, at least uh, three good examples to think uh, uh, about data. Uh, one, which are the earlier panel, the one right before ours, was uh, wrestling with it a little bit. There's data all around. How do you take that and turn it into real information that you can organize? Some of that is by uh, certainly using the latest technology and whatnot to try to manage it, map it, get it out in ways that people can deal with it. So that's a general statement. A second way that communities are using it is to try to make their services much, much more efficient. So for example, in public transportation, it's much easier now with automatic passenger counters and other techniques uh, to really uh, understand how people want to use that transit system so you can take it, redesign it, and do it. But the best thing is in your pocket, uh, and it's what consumers can do. I literally can dial up any major city in the world now and find out when the next bus, the next train. Uh, this takes the fear out of people saying, maybe I will take that step and use the bus or use the train tomorrow. I think that will have a profound effect in the future because there'll be a real choice for people, uh, provided, of course, the service is, is offered. So there's three examples of the way they're using data. One more thing on that, and maybe you could talk about this, Mitchell. Is there some way technology can be used to bring the consensus we talked about is there, to get people to start uh, itself to think about this? Have you seen that before, not just in terms of how they act, but in terms of how they think about cities? Yes. Uh, we use technology. We had unique software to engage the public. That was several years ago. Now there are other applications that are available. But the most important is to have a conversation with the public to talk about the choices, but more importantly, the implications. And often we don't have that conversation. So we wanted to tell the public, if you keep doing this, here are the implications. I mean, we were going through a major drought in 2007, 2008. Right. Uh, everyone was worried. It was very uncertain about the future. I mean, it was a very bad period where if your lawn with brown was a new, was a new green, you know, people smelled you and make sure you had an odor. If you did, that means you were conserving water. They were sniffing you all day. You know, thank you for conserving water. But part of our job was really to give the public a level of certainty about the future that if you do not look at conservation, we're only going to hit this milestone again and again until we can build another wet reservoir. So part of what it is is talking about the consequences, a sprawl pattern. 
we have an aging population. We ask the public, what happens when you turn 70 or 75 and your license is taken away? You are auto-dependent, live in an auto-dependent community, and they said, well, I'm going to depend on a friend. And that friend said, wait a minute, I was going to depend on you. <laughs> we will have isolated seniors. Atlanta now understands this. They're now starting to deal with it. So we had a conversation about the implications and the choices that you cannot avoid. Smart cities know their sense of, you know, either you're going to be in denial or you're going to deal with it. So smart regions, smart cities know their sense of urgency 10 years before it's urgent. And we communicated to the public, are you going to wait till the crisis hits you or are you going to act? And so given the choices, given the implications, the residents time and time again made the right choices and we use all sorts of uh, technology to reach out and that's where we're able to determine that 96% of our residents actually said they supported the choices we placed before them in a comprehensive plan. Technology also is allowing us to show things to people. Many, many people, uh, uh, you know, you can give them all the facts and figures you want, but unless they can see it, unless they can sense it, they can see how it fits in their community. Uh, so things like scenario planning, which you could describe statistically and maybe with one or two artist renderings, now are very possible to do. To uh, uh, go to, uh, to, to record views of neighborhoods in other cities and bring it back home. This is a different right. way of doing it. Dealing with the density issue uh, in that. I had the privilege to be in uh, Hawaii several times over the last few years as they've tried to figure out whether they wanted to improve their bus system only or build a rail line. Well, except for visitors, nobody in Hawaii had ever experienced what a real <laughs> urban right. passenger rail line is about. So new technology allows you to at least give people some sense of what it is that they're being asked to comment upon uh, and some sense of confidence that this is what will result if that, uh, we make that choice. There's also, it's not just how you communicate uh, with the public, but how you receive information back yeah. uh, that can be uh, uh, transformational. Uh, common around the country now are 311 systems. I don't think we have one here in the D.C. area. Uh, but you take every question that comes in uh, from a caller on the 311 system, it goes into a database, whether they're reporting graffiti, a pothole, what's going on uh, at, the, at the local theater, the public theater, what, what art is on, on exhibit at, at, the, uh, at the municipal museum. Uh, and you can see from those patterns exactly what people care about. Uh, and then you can also use those, uh, for example, on a pothole complaint uh, that's dispatched. You see how long it takes to fix that. Uh, so you can immediately start working on the efficiency uh, with which you deliver your services. Uh, and you can hold individual employees accountable uh, if that is not getting done quickly enough. So the ability to receive the information is really important for a smart city. You were going to say something, Mitchell. I just wanted to add, because um, there was a point made about technology, when we looked at the long-range plan pursued by our Metropolitan Planning Organization, it looked pretty bad when we went out to 2035. When we went to this growth center model, it actually improved what was the level of service. It went from poor failing to actually fair to good. So we communicated to the public by going to this growth center model, over the 20 year, 30 year period, it will save the taxpayers hundreds and millions of dollars. And so very often what we have to communicate is the value of smart planning and not just this profession of regulators, but actually we're in a business of saving you, the taxpayers, money over the long haul. And those are kind of the messages using technology that we're able to get across to the public, and it's been highly effective. We also show them the, the, what we call the smart growth dividend by using the value of land, that you, you can use an acre for one high rise, or you can use 600 acres uh, for 150 home, same tax value. And so we're trying to tell the public that if you do not support downtown development or compact development, what you're really saying is, please raise my taxes. I'll carry the tax load. And so we're able to have that conversation about the implications of sprawl. In the long run, your taxes are going to go up, rather than being smart about how to use the value of land. This raises something I want to ask you, Mr. Mayor, which is uh, if, you were, if you'd landed from Mars and come to this conference today as your first stop, you'd think, wow, there's a great potential for political consensus in the United States because these guys sound pretty optimistic that you can get from here to there if you just have a normal, rational conversation with voters and citizens. It's not been my experience um, uh, recently. 
but I want to hear you talk a little bit because you've been mayor. For, you were mayor for, uh, I think you were the sixth and the eighth mayor of, of Albuquerque. Uh, have you seen the public's attitude about essentially uh, j shared planning responsibilities get smarter, sharper, more uh, mature? Uh, are they getting are, are regular citizens getting smarter about city planning in general, not just the city planners? I don't think people, I think planners, architects, uh, public officials tend to be the ones that really focus on how a city works. People know quite well what works for them personally. Uh, and so they'll draw down this little bit of information, that bit of information, only as it applies to enhancing or, uh, their own ability to, to, to live their lives. Uh, and so uh, I'd like to say, yes, everyone has the same level of understanding that an urban planner uh, might have. I don't think they do. I think they know whether it facilitates their lifestyle. And then they make choices based on that. Uh, and that's a huge uh, factor in how cities grow. Uh, and it's not necessarily planned. It's based basically on the free market of individual desire. Let me ask it a different way. Is there a renewed focus you sense in the places that you work about the power and importance of, of, of simply uh, what is local? Yeah, I would, I would say there is. I would say there is a much larger percentage of the population that understands that, it, that, that again, take transportation, that if we're going to spend transportation dollars, that's going to do something to me. It may help me, it may hurt me, it may whatever, but it's going to do something. And um, the uh, federal law has required that the planning process be much more open than it was when I entered uh, the field uh, many years ago. And I see many people taking advantage of it. So there's many more and different people at the table. Um, we're starting to see uh, not just the traditional sort of engineers and people with a very clear vested interest in the outcome of the decision, but we're perhaps seeing advocates for better health in the community coming uh, to wonder about what it means to air quality or what it means to obesity or things like that. So we're seeing in this process, at least I'm seeing a much wider audience. Now some of that depends how you set the process up. I mean, if you try to set it up at a very minimal uh, amount of public involvement, of course you're not going to get as much involvement as if you invite them all in as apparently you did in Raleigh. So, but I, I think generally it is opened up and there are more interests and more groups at the table than when I started. Okay, I want you to play on this question too, but I'm going to ask Mitchell first, which is how, since we all live in multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-racial cities, or most of us do, how do we ensure that everyone even with the great technology advantages that we had that we didn't have before, and a much more open process that everybody gets hurt. That's a challenge now that maybe we didn't have 25 years ago. Well, we set that up front as our commitment to the process because we also looked at generational. We looked at the various generations, the greatest, mature, boomer, X, Y, Z, and we had to reach out to them. And, each, and then we had to look at ethnicity, uh, different uh, Races and, and ethnicities communicate very differently, and so we set up up front a very different process. If we had to go to a church meeting and picnic, we did that. We had in our children's museum, we engaged young people in what we call Kid City. So we used a, a variety of ways. Every other month we had an event to make sure the public was engaged. Uh, we brought out maps to help the residents design their community, and so you can't use one way for one community, and so uh, it was our way of reaching out to the public to make sure we hit those very different audiences because we heard earlier today, usually get the usual suspects, they tend to dominate, have political access, and tend not to get you the results that you want. And so we made a painful effort to go out of our way to make sure that uh, everybody was engaged. Did you just ring a bell? Yeah, well, I, I, we, we watch the, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer in this country, and, and it's, it's uh, frightening to me. Uh, ICLEI is an organization of over 600 local governments around the country. We do most of the climate action planning, sustainability planning for local governments, including uh, the District of Columbia's plan. Uh, and uh, one of the three E's of sustainability is equity. Uh, and the challenge of making sure that those on the lower economic side of the equation have access to the technology. You know, I, I don't like to say the, the bridge to the future anymore because I think that's a little bit trite, but frankly, if that's what uh, technology is, we've got a whole aspect of, of the population in this country that does not have access to that bridge, uh, and we will pay for that 
uh, down the road at much greater volume of dollars than we are today. Is this a particular problem in transportation since you had pulled out your magic timetable? Um, well, it's certainly a challenge, and, and you and you got to do it. Uh, you got to make sure everybody has the chance to come, can come. Not everybody will come, and so you don't. You shouldn't beat yourself up over what you what you can't control. But the mayor is quite right, making sure, and it and it tends to be lesser educated and lesser income people that are the bigger challenge. But uh, if you start with the process yeah, at the beginning, you can do a pretty good job with it. Thank you. They've been trying to cue me to take audience questions. Apparently, they've sent smoke signals, semaphore, nothing has worked. Finally, I got the cue, so sorry. Yeah, I thought it was advisory only. This is <laughs> was a guideline. Yeah, started turning guideline. red, it's just I guess. It's so interesting. All right, we'll go to questions. Forgive me. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Donna McIntyre, okay. State Department. Um, I've loved this afternoon, all day long, the different definitions of intelligent cities, but I haven't heard one that's fairly definitive of what we're talking about. So I'm, I'm looking at, you know, we've talked about livable cities, green cities, healthy cities, low carbon cities, intelligent cities. It's something that um, we really struggle with in the building sector too. What is it that we're talking about so that we can start to measure it, so we can start competition in intelligent cities or whatever we want to call it, sustainable cities. So my question is, um, Really, where where do we where do we look to for these definitions? I know ECLAY or or Global City Facility Indicators. What would you pick as a guide for an index of city metrics? Um, and then before you answer that, I know that LEED really struggled with one particular issue, and then Nabrelli never solved it, which was, can you build a green building in a very unsustainable um, ecosystem, for example, and still get a LEED certification? And can we think about cities, will we ever come to a point for cities where we just shouldn't be investing in certain locations anymore because it's unsustainable or it's just not intelligent? So I'm, that, I'll leave that. Three questions, wow. you get to pick. It's 5.30, <laughs> that was like concentrated, thank you. Uh, let me answer the question this way because the question is asked about intelligent cities and I want to be careful how I answer your question because we are searching in the 21st century, uh, the design profession is searching for the kind of the next era we're moving into. We're not sure what it is. But I caution everybody in the room to differentiate between trends and the trendy. And we're at that period right now where there's buzzwords flying almost every other week and for you to find a source is going to be difficult because I'm not sure if we're looking at the trends or the trendy. There's no question as we go forward, we need to be smarter about how we develop. We need to be more intelligent on how we sustain our communities. There's no question about it due to population growth. But the 21st century, in my opinion, we're struggling to find out which way to go, how to, to be more sustainable, and so you're gonna hear these buzzwords, blue urbanism, landscape urbanism, new urbanism, smart cities, smart regions, intelligent cities. We're in the trend and trendy period right now, but I do believe being smarter how we grow through an intelligent city must be part of that equation because as we grow, the systems will become more complex. So I can't say there's one resource because by next week, there'll be new buzzwords coming out. And I think there's a search to find out what is a panacea to deal with a world that is urbanizing at a rapid pace. So I'm only gonna answer one of your three questions and my colleagues will handle the other two. <laughs> All right, I'll handle the one on lead only after I say I don't think it matters whether you call it a smart city or an intelligent city. Uh, you know, in the context that you're having the discussion, you just have to establish the ground rules. I, it'll, you know, historians will tell us what the period was when we're done with it and we're searching for the next thing. <laughs> On lead, if I understood your question, it was kind of hard to hear, but as I understood your question, uh, if a lead uh, building, you know, platinum is built in the middle of nowhere, is that a good thing? And the answer is sure, it's better than if the lead building, if the building weren't lead. But it would have been much better if it were a non-lead building built in the center of a city that people could travel to by public transit. You'd use a whole lot less energy. Now, if you can get the platinum lead building built in the center of the city, now you got something. So, uh, you know, it's certainly better to do it than not. 
but uh, I was really glad that they've started to work with, N with LEED ND now and some other things that begin to take the context of the building into, uh, into account because uh, ultimately that's, I think, where we want to get on those kinds of things. There was a third question, but I can't remember what it was. Well, there was, what, there was one about whether or not you'll ever have a situation where that vacant piece of property ought not to be built upon. Uh, and, uh, in, pardon? At the city, at the city level, uh, and I guess I would uh, refer you to Mark Twain, who said we could do that, but it would make sense. Uh, so, <laughs> the answer is yes and no. Uh, that point will happen. Good there will be a point, perhaps, when we stop building cities right next to rivers that, that uh, overflow on a regular basis, uh, next to oceans that have rising uh, uh, sea level. Uh, but uh, it's going to not be pretty in the process. Thank you, gentlemen. Yes. I'm Amy Tarts. I'm with the National Capital Planning Commission here in Washington, D.C. And my, um, I guess my question is, um, can you talk a little bit about smart cities and their resilience to disaster? Um, not, not just in terms of planning for disaster, but also in the recovery aspect. Um, currently, the more I talk to people who have been victims of the current and the past, you know, from Katrina to present, a lot of these um, uh, friends of mine who had personally experienced being in such a disaster um, have told me that pretty much predominantly their communities are dependent on FEMA. But it seems to me that the cities are also starting, in certain cases, certain cities have more resources and are more prepared than other cities in terms of helping their residents. But there's also that vulnerable population. And again, there's that divide between people who have means and people who don't, and the communities with means have a quicker way of recovering and actually uh, reestablishing their communities versus parts of the city where because it's, they, they are communities of lesser means, they're still struggling to even recover from, um, you know, from whatever disaster has happened. So I would be interested to, um, again, uh, hear if you've heard of any new ways of uh, cities to become more sustainable in terms of their resiliency to disaster? Well, you do know that I think the majority of our population, at least here in the U.S. and probably around the world, live very close to the coast. So hazard mitigation and what we're seeing in terms of the storm events uh, is certainly something that hazard mitigation uh, is going to increase over time. Uh, as we see more and more people living on the coast. So it is incumbent upon those regions, those cities, uh, to understand how they have to be smarter, how they plan and adapt to some of the climate change. I can't tell you if I know of any examples. There's a lot of research going on in terms of the Dutch and how they're working uh, with uh, the uh, city of New Orleans. Uh, there'll be a conference next year in L.A. to see how we can deal uh, in terms of uh, some of the sea level rise and how they've been successful. So there are examples, there's no question, as I said earlier, as we grow, we have to be a lot smarter and more and more of the world's population are living in hazard prone areas. So hazard mitigation, in my opinion, we will have to get smarter because more of our population will live there. But other than that one example of the Dutch and what they're doing in the Netherlands and how they're trying to apply that work in New Orleans uh, is just one example that I'm aware of. Well, there are certainly many places that have a particular problem and they're better at solving that problem. I mean, certainly the last few years in Florida have taught a lot of communities down there to be much better prepared for hurricanes. Now, I don't know if those same communities are pretty well prepared for earthquakes, but they know hurricanes. Likewise, the west coast of the U.S., certainly. I mean, the, the retrofitting of the infrastructure in California of billions and billions of dollars in hopes of mitigating the problem with it. Uh, one thing that we're starting to think about is not only the planning for these things, but what's the resilience factor of the city? Uh, if you have, uh, you know, the proverbial only one road in and one road out, and it's by the sea, well, you, you're running a great deal of risk if you're in an area that has lots of flooding and that. Or how about uh, instead of all focusing just on roads, then making sure you've got a decent public transit system, making sure where your priorities are in the community for recovery. But uh, I think there's a lot more work going on that. Uh, uh, interestingly, I think we usually blame the media. This actually is a time where media deserves some thanks because all of us see the results of disasters 
in ways that 25 years ago we didn't, oh yeah, we heard there was a tornado in Joplin. Well, now we see it, we live it, and it makes it much easier for communities to get the will together to do uh, planning and implementation and practice. When, when you don't mitigate in regard to climate change, then you have to adapt. Uh, and one of the things that's come out of that conversation of a, uh, adaptation uh, is this whole notion of resilience. And I think that probably is the most important question uh, for every city in America. Is your community resilient? Uh, how quickly can you spring back or adapt uh, from some sort of, of event or uh, 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 make sure that, that you're going to sustain your community? Uh, I, we watched all of us watching what's going on in Japan. And I'll tell you, in terms of their built environment, infrastructure, uh, above and below ground, they're probably one of the most resilient countries uh, on the planet, far more uh, than the United States today. Uh, I was on the receiving end at the bottom of the steps as refugees or, or evacuees came down uh, from New Orleans. And about half of those that, that came to Albuquerque from New Orleans stayed. They didn't go back. Uh, and, and, I, and I can't imagine what would have happened here in the United States if we had the type of event that just happened in Japan. Uh, so that really is the $64,000 question. Yeah. And it's fundable uh, because it's important. It's where people live. Resilience factor. Yes, sir. Thanks for waiting. Uh, my name is Jay Hellman. I sometimes introduce myself as George Bernard Shaw's unreasonable man. Because <laughs> Shaw said progress is the work of unreasonable men because reasonable men accept things the way they are. Well, I've been working on solving the conflict between how we regulate land use and the transportation systems that we build. And in particular, since we've been living with the automobile for so many decades, we have not brought rational thinking back to creating pedestrian fabrics surrounding rail stations so that more people can use the rail just by walking to it. Sure. The deficit of WMATA in this region causes the state of Maryland to write a check for $261 million. Nobody pays any attention to that, but we should because the state was well underwater this year, as are many local governments. So my question, it may be directed to you, Bill, more than anyone else, is what kind of data or experience do we sure. have for areas that have less of a deficit because they have a more balanced usage of the rail system, more symmetrical, and more hours of the day so that there is revenue generated more efficiently? That's why I answered earlier tying land use and transportation together in a rational way. Um, transit, this is a trite statement of the day, you can write it down, trite statement of the day, transit is more used when you walk to it. I mean, if you already got to get in your car and drive a mile or two or five to get to a park and ride, well, some of you are going to just keep right on going in your car. So redesigning it in that way, um, figuring out different ways to pay for it. Uh, I had always heard in my professional career, gee, go to Hong Kong, go to Japan, the transit systems make money. So I went to Hong Kong, I went to Japan, they have marvelous transit systems, and they don't make any money on their transit. They make a fortune on their real estate. In this country, the federal law is you can buy just enough land with the federal money to put your transportation improvement and not a square inch more than that. Uh, and so the value that a transit uh, station brings goes to the private sector. Now, there's nothing wrong with the private sector making a buck. I don't have any problem with that at all. But the opportunity for the transit system, perhaps to pay for itself with the real estate and uh, with the proceeds of the real estate development or the value that has been created by the public investment, seems to me the public ought to get that back in more than just increased property taxes. I think we're ready to start to have that discussion here. Uh, as painful as the building of the Silver Line to Dulles is, at least it does include a major component of the uh, property owners uh, paying for a lot of it. We're starting to see uh, creative uses of transportation improvement districts, of tax increment financing, and a whole host of other things that we didn't think we could use in transportation, now we are. So I think, I think we're starting to understand it. We're looking at examples around the world and going, hey, there's a version of that 
that would work in the US. It may not be exactly like Hong Kong, but there's some version of that that we can figure out how to make uh, happen here. Now, Raleigh is pursuing a light rail system, so I'll say it officially, Mayberry is going metro. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, our advantage is because of the growth centers that I talked about, our light rail system will be connecting all of those growth centers. Right now, the entitlement on the ground, low density, but what we're doing is we're mapping within a half mile radius a grid. That's about the best we can do because it may take 10 years for that development to come and some in the real estate community aren't sure transit's ever coming because we were denied the first time from uh, the federal government. But if we put that grid in, whatever development we get, it is now pedestrian friendly and transit ready and you can still develop. And I don't know what happened in most places. If I would look at the WMATA line, I am sure, as I heard earlier, there are parking lots and the, it's really the road network, the network which will support the, de the development. And that's something that we're learning and we're putting it in place along all of the uh, stops so that when development does come, the road and pedestrian network is already in place. That already is gonna bump up value tremendously and then we can see it turning over once the light rail does arrive, and it will. Marty, final thought? No, I suspect we're speaking to the choir on these, on, on these issues. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, ultimately the marketplace of individuals, particularly young individuals, is going to make uh, this decision. Uh, they understand the, the, quality, the value of walkable communities. Uh, I don't own a car any longer, uh, but it works here in Washington. I assure you, when I go home to Albuquerque, not so good. But... Uh, there's a community uh, in Albuquerque, as are in all other western cities, that are moving in that direction. Uh, we can't afford to do anything uh, any other way. And uh, as you alluded to, I mean, except for the uh, unusual toll road or something, roads don't pay for themselves either. Uh, it's much cheaper to have transit-oriented development. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the people in Raleigh and Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, or Pittsburgh, uh, and Albuquerque are really, have been and are really lucky to have these three guys, and we are really lucky to have them here today. So we'll give a round of applause. Thank you very much. <laughs>